Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name's Andrew and today we're going to be looking at one of the most overlooked ethnic groups in the Russian Federation, the Aleuts. The Aleuts, or Uganana in their native tongue simply meaning the people, are the inhabitants of the Aleutian Islands, situated between the Russian Far East and Alaska. The Aleuts are thus divided by citizenship, with the majority being American citizens, whilst a minority being citizens of the Russian Federation. As such, they are the only Native American ethnic group in the Russian Federation. Within the Russian Federation, they can be found almost exclusively on the Commander Islands, with as of the last official census in 2010, numbering less than 500. In contrast, their American cousins stand at nearly 7,000, with a further 17,000 people estimated to have partial Aleut ancestry. The capital of the Aleuts in Russia is seen to be the city of Nikolskoye, the administrative capital of the Alutsky district within the Kamchatka Krai. Given the fact that historically the Aleuts lived on a separate island in the Aleutian chain, often as very separate entities to each other, there has been no historic capital to speak of. Interestingly, even the name Alut is a little bit unclear as to where it has come from. Some believe this comes from the nearby Chukchi word for islander, Aliat. However, this is disputed by other sources, most notably by the source of Vitus Bering, one of the first Russians to encounter the Aleuts, who refer to them from the Chukchi word for big teeth. In addition to speaking Russian in the Alutsky district and English in Alaska, the Aleuts actually have their own language, called Unanam Tunu, or simply the people's language. This falls into the Eskimo Alut branch family tree and has three distinct dialects still spoken today. Eastern, Western, known as Atkan, and the Bering dialect, also known as Atuan. These three dialects can actually be broken down even further, pretty much by island to island basis, with the Pribilov dialect being the most popular of these sub-dialects. Interestingly, there is actually a fourth language that the Aleuts may speak, a Creole language called the Midni, coming from the Midni or Copper Island. This language is a hybrid of Alut and Russian blended together, though all three of the sub-dialects of the main Alut language do have a legacy of Russian influence, particularly in their grammar. For those of you who are interested, it sounds a little like this. <laughs> The Alut language, despite having a Cyrillic alphabet since 1826 and a Latin-based one since 1870, is facing extinction. This is due to the number of native speakers diminishing rapidly, with one of the latest estimates putting the total number of Alut speakers as native speakers in both the Alaskan and Russian parts at only 500. The first written records of the Aleuts we have from 1741 from Vitus Bering. Whilst on his second great expedition to find a theorized land bridge between Asia and America, he encountered the Aleuts in kayaks near the island of Atka. However, archaeologists have proven the Aleuts were there far beyond this first encounter and are estimated to have arrived in the Aleut Islands from the Alaskan mainland around 2000 BC. As the archaeology suggests, Norway limited the Aleutian Islands, with evidence of them travelling far and wide in search of furs and food. In fact, the Aleutian penchant for tattooing and piercings actually led to them being dubbed big teeth by the Chukchi who they encountered. Vitus' expedition in 1741 was followed two years later by Yamilian Basov, an entrepreneurial fur hunter or promishelnik. Seeking furs for the insatiable Russian fur market, he found a plenty supply of furs on the Aleutian Islands, which he then took back to Russia to make his fortune. His success on the Aleutian Islands made him a rich man back in Moscow. However, it also condemned the Aleuts to centuries of misery. More Premishelniki arrived, eager to find their fortunes with the fur trade. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the demand for furs in Russia and continental Europe was vast and could command a huge price. This encouraged more and more adventurers to seek out and take these furs. As easy to gather furs in Siberia decreased, a good fur could command a huge price, and though these Purmashalniki went further and further afield, eventually arriving in large numbers in the Aleutian Islands. As the number of furs there also began to decline in ease, 
the Promisioniki began to impose themselves on the Aleutian people. Aleutian men were forced to pay yasak in furs for the newly arrived Promisioniki, armed of course with European weaponry. Failure to pay this yasak would result in indiscriminate killing and mass rape. By the end of the 18th century, initial good relations between the Russians and the Lutes had soured severely, as there were fewer furs to find, harsher punishments, and more and more people arriving from Siberia seeking furs. It's important to note that it wasn't a purely Russian expansion, as the Russians who arrived were often Chukchi or Koyaks who had been drafted into Russian service or simply paid to do so. In 1799, the Aleutian Islands were put under the control of the Russian-American company. From new arrivals, disease and violence had decimated the Aleut population by an estimated 50%. In turn, more Russian subjects arrived in the Aleutian Islands to colonize and take over the fur trade. This in turn led to a dilution of the Aleut population, as more Russian and other Siberian groups settled on the island. Furthermore, the dearth of available furs on the island from the 19th century onwards Onward, led to many Aleuts being hired out as labourers or guides to other peoples, including the Americans. In a tragic case, this actually resulted in the genocide of another Native American people from California, the Nicolino. The Aleuts who encountered them had had to venture further and further to find furs to pay their yasak with, and after a confrontation, unintentionally wiped out the entire ethnic group. Further woe followed as smallpox arrived on the Aleutian Islands, to which the Aleut people had no natural defence. In 1824, Father Ion Veniaminov arrived on the island of Unalaska with the intention to convert the Aleuts to Orthodox Christianity. He was so successful in this endeavour that most Aleuts today still practice Russian Orthodoxy, even those living in Alaska. In 1867, the Aleutian Islands, with the exception of the Commander Islands and 15 uninhabited islands, were sold to the United States of America for $7.2 million. This caused the Aleutian story to be split into both Russian and American parts. This being all about Russia, I will start with the former. Within the Russian Empire, the Aleuts continued their native way of life for most of the 19th and 20th centuries. With an ever-increasing decline of furs available, the Aleuts would continue to hunt, fish and whale for food, while selling out their services as seamen and guides to Americans and Russians in the area. This in turn allowed the Aleut population, which had been decimated since contact with Europeans, to actually recover somewhat, and by 1899 the population in the Russian part of the Aleutian Islands for the Aleuts had risen to around 700. The First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War all kind of passed the Aleutian Islands by in relative obscurity, and it wasn't until 1923 when any Soviet forces arrived on the island to let them know they were now part of the Soviet Union. Two years later, in 1925, work began on expanding and repairing the fisheries in the Aleutian Islands, providing more stable and regular work for the Aleuts. Shortly afterwards, a fur farm was constructed on the island of Bering. This was a positive step for the Aleut people and had the impact of drawing the Aleuts from several different islands to primarily two in the Commander Islands. In 1928, the Aleutsky was established within the Kamchatka Krai. This was in keeping with Soviet ideology on minorities of the former Russian Empire and their rights to self-determination. In contrast to their American cousins, the Second World War largely passed over the Aleuts in the Soviet Union. In fact, it wasn't until 1967 that anything of particular note occurred for the Aleut people. Due to the inefficiency of running a fishery on Medney Island, the Aleut population there were resettled on Bering Island, making it the only island within the Soviet Union that was inhabited by the Aleut people. With the fall of the Soviet Union, like many of the minorities in the now Russian Federation, the Aleuts took a renewed interest in their history and culture. In 1994, both a radio station and a newspaper was established speaking in the Aleut language to encourage those to relearn their ancient tongue. In contrast, their American cousins had arguably a worse experience. In 1867, when the Aleutian Islands were largely purchased by America, the Aleuts found themselves categorised as an uncivilised tribe, simply meaning a Native American group who had not westernised. 
as was the case with such tribes, they were allotted an agent from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to oversee their development and to ensure that any rights were upheld and laws not broken. As was often the case with these arrangements, that was not actually upheld and many Aleuts found themselves having to hire themselves out to nearby whaling vessels just to make ends meet. This was in part because commercial fishing vessels would regularly overfish in historically Aleut territories. In 1910, as part of a systematic effort to destroy Native American culture and society, the Aleut language was banned. Children were taken to boarding schools to learn English and were often beaten for using their native tongue, even if it was Russian. In 1924, as part of a larger machination, the Aleuts were granted US citizenship. Whilst this meant they no longer needed an agent from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, this was more of a technicality, and for many aspects of their life, nothing changed. With each passing generation from 1910 onwards, fewer and fewer Aleuts could remember their own language or remember their traditions. This in turn meant they were not teaching it to the next generation and were becoming more and more Americanized. Whilst the First World War did pass the American Aleuts, the second did not. In June 1942, Japanese forces invaded the American Aleutian Islands, occupying the islands of Kiska and Atu. The Aleutians living on these islands were deported to Hokkaido for the duration of the war. With the Aleutian Islands being an active war zone, the Aleutians living there were then deported by the US government to mainland Alaska. They were there put in internment for their own protection. Yes, dear viewer, you heard that correctly. Due to the Aleutian Islands being a war zone, the Aleuts were deported from these islands, put in internment camps where 79 of them would die. To put this in perspective, only 17 Aleuts died in the Hokkaido internment camps. Whilst the Aleuts did receive some financial compensation for this in the 1988 Aleut Restitution Act, they only received an apology in 2017. What? After the end of the war in 1945, the Aleuts were allowed to return to their homeland, apart from those who lived on the island of Atu, who were forced to live on different islands. In 1967, as part of a wider civil rights movement, there was a reversal on the ban of the Aleuts' native language. This was followed four years later by the Alaskan Native Claims Settlement Act, which gave a regular government stipend to the Aleutian people for stolen land and destroyed way of life. Today, in both Russia and the US, there has been a revival in the Aleut language, with schools teaching in the Aleut language in both Nikolskoye and Unalashka. It's hard to put in the words the impact historic persecution has had on the Aleutian people. But perhaps statistics can help us understand a little bit more. In 2011, there were 150 native speakers in a population of 8,000. That's in both America and Russia. Furthermore, there are an estimated 17,000 people of partial Aleut ancestry in the Russian Federation alone. The legacy of historic abuses against Aleut women. The Aleut community in Russia is limited to one island in one district, while their American cousins are slightly more spread out but still facing an uphill struggle. This is both in a financial sense, as funding this revival is not cheap, but also as seeing it as something not to be ashamed of. With such damning evidence, it's easy to see how Aleutian language and culture rests on a knife's edge. Historically, the Aleuts made clothes out of the sea creatures native to the region. Otters, seals, puffins and birds. Traditionally, they would wear large waterproof coats called kamalikas, with women wearing seal or otter parkas called sacks, while the men would wear parkas additionally made from bird skin, or, if they were going onto the water, made of entrails. Making this clothing was very time consuming, with over 40 steps required to make just a parka. They were also known by the Chukchi for wearing large wooden hats, often decorated with feathers. Another cosmetic feature seen on the Aleuts was tattooing. Traditionally, these were done to ward off evil, but also to show where a person was from, as it would indicate which island they originally came from. 
This was very common for both men and women. Traditionally, the Aleuts were shamanists, with belief in many spirits and deities that could either help or hinder depending on the circumstances. Various rituals done to invoke their blessing or to avoid their ire were also very common. However, today very few of these rituals have actually survived, with only a tiny percentage of Aleuts still practicing these beliefs. As mentioned earlier, the vast majority of Aleuts are Russian Orthodox. Interestingly though, in regards to Aleutian traditional religion, there has been one aspect which has seen a surprising revival, two-spiriting. Traditionally, in Aleut culture, there were more than just men and women, there were actually two more genders. Ayagiguk, which was when a man transformed into a woman, and Tayagiguk, which is when a woman transformed into a man. This unusual dynamic was first noticed by Russian explorers who noted that these two-spirited people would accompany long hunting trips and often provide several services including sexual. With the modern LBGTQ movement growing in popularity, this part of Illusion culture has actually seen a bit of a revival and a large amount of publicity. However, on Bering Island, in keeping with Russian traditional values, it has been less so. It's easy to forget that the Aleut constitute one of the many nationalities of modern Russia, given their extreme location and relatively small size. However, they are a fascinating people with a rich culture and language despite a tragic past. Thank you for watching. My name was Andrew. Up next are the Altai. Paka!